Hey, thank you, everyone, and everybody on the line. I want to say good afternoon and welcome to this session of August Smith Clean Air Leadership Talks. 2021 winners of California Air Resources Board's Hog and Schmidt Clean Air Awards. The Hog and Schmidt Clean Air Leadership Talks are a unique and exciting way to learn about real world air pollution problems and innovative solutions from individuals who have earned California's premier air quality award for their career contributions, which I think you'll all enjoy. Today, we are so pleased and grateful to have presentations from all six of the Hog and Schmidt Smith awardees. After a brief overview of the award program, I will introduce each of the winners in turn before they present. We'll conclude with a special posthumous recognition as well as a special thank you to our retiring Hogan Schmidt advisory members. They advise the chair on the selection of each awardees. We'll be aiming to conclude around 3.30. Slide. Considered the Nobel Prize in Air Quality Achievement, the Hoggersmith Clean Air Awards are named for the CARB's first chairman, the late Dr. Ari Hoggersmith, who is best known as the father of air pollution control for linking the smog in Southern California to automobile emissions in the 1940s and 50s. Dr. Hoggersmith, a native of the Netherlands, was a leader in developing air quality standards based on his research efforts. He was a graduate of the University of Utrecht and a biochemistry professor at the California Institute of Technology in Pasadena for 16 years before beginning his air pollution research in 1948. At Caltech, Dr. Hoggerson studied the physiological aspects of natural products, work that led to studies investigating the flavor components of such things as wine. This training and expertise in chemistry along with his natural curiosity, brought him to the forefront of air pollution research when he was asked by the County of Los Angeles to investigate the chemical nature of what was called smog. Noticeably different from earlier accounts of haze and dust in London, which was caused by coal, the eye-irritating haze in Los Angeles was brown and almost odorless. Dr. Hoggersmith applied his techniques of studying plant chemistry in closed chambers exposed to sunlight to figure out what caused smog in the Los Angeles basin. Through a series of experiments, he concluded that most of California's smog resulted from photochemistry. When substances in the exhaust from motor vehicles and the smokestacks of industrial facilities react with sunlight to create it. This break, breakthrough provided the scientific foundation for the development of both California and the nation's air pollution control. Dr. Hoggenschmidt passed away in 1977, but his legacy lives. Every year with the Hoggenschmidt Clean Air, are recognized individuals through their achievements in research, environmental policy, science and technology, public education, climate change science, international leadership, and community service in environmental justice. Through distinguished careers, these awardees have made outstanding contributions to improving air quality. They have influenced important changes throughout the United States and the world, protecting public health in the air we breathe. The first 2020-2021 Hoggersmith Clean Air Awardee in the category of climate change science is Professor C.J. Somerville. He is an internationally recognized climate scientist and an expert on communicating clearly to the public what scientists have learned about climate change. He is a distinguished professor emeritus at Scripps Institution of, of Oceanography, University of California, San Diego, 
where he has been a professor since 1979. Unfortunately, Professor Somerville was unable to be with us here today in person, but we do have his talk pre-recorded. Our planetary physicians. And I had a fascinating experience recently. My doctor retired. I had to get a new doctor. I chose one. We met. And he looked at me and said, sit down. I want to tell you how I feel about practicing medicine. Three things, he said. First, I'm competent. I know what I'm doing. And second, I'm honest. If something happens I don't understand, I'll tell you. And third, I'm only here to advise you. You will make all the decisions. I was really impressed. No doctor had ever talked like that to me before. And there's something else. We climate scientists, planetary physicians, are also competent and honest and only here to advise. So the first interesting question is, is the world really warming? And the answer is unequivocally, yes, it is warming. Here, the temperatures on global average are broken down by decade. You can see the warmest years are the decades on the right. In fact, in each of the last two decades, every single year was warmer than the average temperature of the previous decade. So the world is unequivocally warming. This record goes back to the 1800s and all of the warmest years in that record are recent years. And there's more evidence for global warming too. Here, the white up arrows mean increasing trends, the black down arrows mean decreasing trends. And you can see that the ocean and the atmosphere are both warming. Sea level is rising. There's more water vapor in the atmosphere, but ice and snow cover and glaciers and ice sheets are all decreasing. All of these observed trends are unambiguous signs of a warming world. And we've done diagnosis like good doctors. So we know it's not naturally caused. So for example, we monitor the sun. The output of the sun is that red line and you can see it goes up and down. It fluctuates with the 11 year cycle but there's no long-term upward trend as there is on the blue line, which is temperature. So changes in the sun are not responsible for the warming. And in the same way, we've quantitatively ruled out all the other candidates for warming. It's not natural, it's human caused. And the main human cause is the waste products from the fuels that we use for most of our energy, coal, oil, and natural gas. When we burn them, we use the atmosphere as a free dump. And the worst waste product for climate is carbon dioxide. It builds up in the atmosphere. And here's the record called the Keeling curve of more than half a century of measurements showing the increase of the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. We had long ago predicted that if this strong an increase were to happen, the world would warm because this is a heat trapping gas that adds to the natural greenhouse effect. And that predicted global warming has now been observed. Sometimes, different aspects of climate change even faster than we had predicted. And here's an example of something we don't fully understand yet. What you're looking at is the extent of Arctic sea ice, which reaches a minimum every year at the end of summer around September. And in recent years, it's often been so low that it's lower than half of what it was before the year 2000. So here's a recent year on the right, a, recent, a year, typical year before 2000 on the left, and you see this extraordinary change that wasn't forecast. This storm reminds us that climate has many aspects. Global warming is just a symptom, like a fever is a symptom of disease. But two of the things that happen, as I've said, are that the ocean sea level rises and that in the atmosphere, the amount of water vapor increases. And those two changes alone can make severe weather events like hurricanes potentially more damaging because the biggest cause of damage from hurricanes is flooding. Higher sea level increases the risk of ocean flooding and more water vapor in the atmosphere increases the risk of flooding from, from heavy rain. What you're looking at here are computer projections for the four seasons of precipitation changes towards the end of the current century. Green is wetter, brown is drier. And in general, the wetter regions become even more wet and the drier regions become even more dry. So you can see the northern United States 
is becoming more wet in winter. The southwestern United States is becoming more dry in spring. The west is already arid, and further drying can have severe consequences. So it can reduce agricultural productivity, for example, and it can increase the risk of wildfires. In Southern California, most of the water we use is already imported from Sierra Snowpack and from the Colorado River, and both of those water sources are shrinking because of global warming. The diagnosis from we climate scientists or planetary physicians is that the world is seriously addicted to fossil fuels. And the right thing to do is to end this addiction as soon as possible. Otherwise, global warming will continue unabated. The way to, to limit it to moderate or tolerable levels is to reduce the world's dependence on fossil fuels with the consequent increase of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that leads to global warming. There's no silver bullet that solves this problem, but there's lots of silver buckshot. Increased energy efficiency, increased energy conservation help, and greater reliance on sun and wind and water is essential. These renewable resources are already widely available and often cost competitive with fossil fuels. You can ask what's the best way to encourage a transition to clean energy. And uh, the answer is that many thoughtful people have advocated carbon taxes of various kinds. But climate scientists are not generally experts on taxes. We're all specialists, you know. You don't ask your cardiologist for advice on a root canal, and you don't speak to your dentist about heart surgery. So what people should do is listen to experts on energy policy and on taxes, and then decide. Here's the bottom line, if you like, a forecast of what the warming is likely to be in the United States toward the end of the current century for two different scenarios. On the right is what we can look forward to if growth of heat trapping gases continues unabated, if we continue to emit these gases into the atmosphere. And what you see is a warming that for many parts of the United States amounts to seven or eight degrees Fahrenheit. That's very, very large and will have severe consequences. On the left is an alternative future. If we restrict the emissions of heat trapping gases like carbon dioxide, we can limit warming by the end of this century to perhaps half of what it is on the right, say three or four degrees Fahrenheit. That's much to be, pre prepared, <coughs> much to be preferred. And we have that choice now. The future is in our hands. We control the thermostat on the climate that our children and grandchildren and their descendants will inherit. Because carbon dioxide, once it's in the atmosphere, accumulates. It stays there for a very long time. And so while we're dithering and procrastinating and wondering what to do, it's building up in the atmosphere. Thus, the window of opportunity to exercise the choice that we have doesn't stay open forever. In fact, it closes very soon. So it's urgent that we make a decision, we the people of the world make a decision to limit the growth of heat trapping gases. I think that what you do about global warming shouldn't depend on your politics. I think that all of us should want to preserve and protect the planet that we have to avoid contamination and pollution to cleanse and purify rather than to misuse and degrade. That should be a choice for everyone. So I'm a climate scientist and a planetary physician, and uh, we're competent. We know what we're doing. We're honest. When something arises that we don't know about, we'll tell you. And we're here to advise not to make decisions. So listen to your doctors, you'll learn something useful, but then you, all of you will decide. Thank you. I wanna thank Dr. Summerall, obviously very relevant to some of the work we do here at CARB, especially with our scoping plan, just recently going out our draft. Um, Next, I'm happy to introduce Professor Paul Ong in the category of Air Quality Community Service, Environmental Justice. Professor Ong has engaged in a lifelong commitment to air quality, 
working for over three decades as a scientist and educator on interdisciplinary social science and environmental teaching. Policy focus and community engagement. He is research professor at the UCLA Luskin School of Public Affairs and the director of the Center for Neighborhood Knowledge. Welcome, Professor Ong. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. How is everyone doing? Good lunch. I had a good lunch. Okay, can we get started uh, with my slide? Okay, so I want to put my brief 12 minutes in a broader sense of what my colleagues and I have been doing. First, I want to make sure I thank the people who nominated me, uh, particularly Professors Wu, Houston, and Pastor. Uh, I'm deeply embedded to their thoughts about me, but it's they who really do the hard work. Uh, today, I want to talk about how do we uh, democratize knowledge within environmental justice. Next slide, please. So, an overview. The truth of the matter is that social and racial justice should be and is the cornerstone when we think about a just transition in response to climate change. And a just transition just means that everybody is entitled to the benefits of our actions, our policies, our fundings, our resources. And part of that, part of that moving towards a just transition involves meaningful participation of those who historically been marginalized in the decision-making process. We ought not, as just uh, you heard, dictate what we should be doing to others. We should be advising. And we should hear voices from many different corners, not just from the traditional corners. So we need to move forward in terms of changing institutionally, changing our cultures in terms of how we think about decision making. And for me, empowering citizens, empowering those who we invite to the table must involve equipping them, enabling them to make informed and evidence-based input. Next slide, please. So how do we go about doing that? How do we sort of democrat, make a democracy true in terms of decision-making and inclusion? And how do we do that as researchers and scholars? And I propose that there are at least four key elements. One is we need to produce environmental justice knowledge on inequality. It is traditional scholarship. And the truth of the matter is scholarship is never neutral. What we decide is important to study is deeply embedded in our society. What we prioritize, where we put our dollars, reflects, sadly, often the inequalities in our society. And we must move beyond that at the university when we do our more basic research. The second one, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> The second one is collaboration with others in terms of defining research. I'm not saying we need to do that for every piece of research we do, but certainly we must make room for research that involves hearing the voices of the stakeholders in terms of how they define what is of value to them. What are their priorities? We also need to make whatever information, data, knowledge that we generate available to people. That's how they come to the point of being informed and have evidence in terms of their action. And finally, we need to think about how to make this sustainable, this transformation in the way we think about data, information, and knowledge, in terms of transformation that carries on from today into tomorrow. Next slide, please. So we need to generate environmental justice knowledge. And I'm talking about more basic science and social science research. Next slide, please. So I am incredibly grateful to my colleagues because they have educated me on things I am ignorant about. And I fully admit I'm 
deeply ignorant about things. And so I like to listen and hear from my colleagues. Uh, example are a one project that carried on for a decade with my colleagues. It's a mix of a atmospheric chemist, somebody in public health, somebody in city urban planning, and an economist. It is different views that enrich the way we try to understand and do research about the basic fundamental forces that produce and reproduce this inequality. And that knowledge is important if we are going to have sound policy. Next slide, please. So collaboration with stakeholders. There are elements of our research that we really benefit from by listening to those who've been marginalized. They have a worldview that many of us don't understand. We have not lived that experience. We don't know what it means to be marginalized. And therefore, we need to understand what's important to them. What are the questions they want answered? Next slide, please. So I just want to give you a couple of quick examples where we work with different stakeholders in terms of trying to uh, do collaborative research to better understand other people's priorities. An uh, example of that is a work with the California League of Conservation Voters uh, Education Fund in trying to understand how Asian Americans view environmentalism, their environment, what they value, and so forth. Another example, uh, and that was done with Paula Daniels. I don't know if people know Paula Daniels. She's a fantastic person. She's also a person of color. But she's done tremendous work in terms of food security here in this region and nationally. Uh, another example is something we just finished a couple of years ago, is looking at transportation disparities and access to health care. And that was done with the Asian Health Services in Oakland. And having that input telling us, you know, what are the key things that we ought to look for? What do we prioritize? The truth matters, we never have enough fun to cover everything. So we have to prioritize, but we should prioritize with input from those who are at risk. Next slide, please. So part of it is not just generating knowledge, generating knowledge jointly in partnership. It's also making that information known and accessible to those who have a stake in this. Next slide, please. So I've been incredibly pleased with the work that we have done collaboratively with the California Air Resource Board. We jointly generated, I think, and maybe I'm going a little bit overboard, but the first massive deep dive in understanding how transportation inequality varies from neighborhood to neighborhood, the causes of transportation inequality, the patterns of transportation inequality, and the consequences of it. And based on real data, observed data, not just model. And that was hard work. But what was more important is making that available. So a key component of that project, and I again thank CARB for this, is making a mapping data portal available. So this information is available not just to professionals, not just to the decision makers, but to those who every day face the risk of environmental pollution, of traffic, of the consequences of those things. So on the bottom is a link if you want to go look at it. It's not perfect. We got a long ways to go to make it perfect. But I think it's a huge step forward. Next slide, please. And so having that data, having that knowledge, there's a need to put it into action. Next slide, please. So a couple of examples. I, I just want to give an example, the most current example, but we have done this for decades. Uh, currently, we're working with the South Bay uh, Bicycle Coalition Plus. And this is an organization that's dedicated to promoting active transportation, certainly as an alternative to motorized vehicle, ICE. And the idea is that you got to have the infrastructure, you got to have the safety. And that's only gonna happen in part by advocates pushing for it. And the plus part actually is started off with South Bay Coalition. And they're in the South Bay. For those who are from Los Angeles, you know the South Bay. It's next to the beach. It's affluent. Very few people of color. 
And they are great. They have the foundations to be advocates. They have the money. They have the political pool. The plus part came when I started work with Jim to expand the coalition. So we now have Inglewood and Compton. Again, for those not from Los Angeles, those are communities of color. Those are communities with lots of low-income people. And I'm grateful that a mainstream organization could do that. What's interesting is that they are data-driven. I worked with them in terms of understanding the patterns of usage, accidents, and consequences. And they continue down that road. That is, collecting information to advocate for better infrastructure and safety, but advocate for a very diverse set of communities. And just this week, we had a meeting about developing an app for crowdsourcing. That is getting people who are on the ground involved in the research to generate the data. Next slide, please. And so the final thing I wanna talk about is that we need to not just do this as individuals, not do this in an ad hoc fashion, piecemeal fashion. We must transform the institutions to ensure sustainability of this type of work. And the way we try to do that, next slide please, is essentially embedding within the way we train, for example, our students. And in part for me, that means including EJ courses. So our students can understand this dimension and make it a part of their work, part of the profession, part of their commitments in terms of moving forward. And we've done that by creating classes. And so I'm very proud to work with Sylvia Gonzalez, my colleague and dear friend, on creating the first class in UCLA. We also try to understand for more basic research with some of our other colleagues, understand why is it so difficult to get universities to embrace EJ. And we try to understand the institutional barriers to a number of research projects, about understanding how universities are structured culturally, institutionally, that creates barrier. But it's just not an academic exercise. We hope that knowledge will allow us to address those barriers so we can transform the curriculum so we can have a pipeline in the future of scholars, activists who are knowledgeable, who do research on behalf of environmental justice. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ong. Next, I'm proud to introduce Mr. Kung Shu Lee, who has been awarded a 2020-2021 Hoggenschmidt Clean Air Award in the category of International Air Quality Leadership. Mr. Lee has worked for over 20 years on the management of vehicle emissions in China, with a focus on Beijing, promoting and implementing numerous mobile source emission control measures that significantly contributed to the improvement of Beijing's atmospheric environmental quality. He is also a senior engineer, vice chairman of the Automotive Engineering Society of China, and a member of the Oil Product Application and Development Professional Committee of China's Petroleum Society. Unfortunately, due to travel restrictions, Mr. Li was unable to be with us here today in person, but we have his talk pre-recorded. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Quinshan Li from Beijing Bureau of Ecology and Environment. I have been working on the control the automobile emission for more than 20 years. Since the last century, Beijing took the method to control the vehicle emission. The vehicle population in Beijing increased rapidly from 1 billion in 1998 to 6.4 billion million in 2021, according to the research. The mobile 
emissions contribute 45 percent of the Beijing annual PM 2.5 in year 2021 is the major air pollution resources in Beijing area. Since the year 2002, Beijing has uh, implemented more than 20 local standards. We set up the local standard systems, including the vehicle emission, fuel quality, vapor recovery, and the no road vehicles. And uh, more than 100 uh, measures, policies, regulations have been implement, implemented over the past 20 years. Most of the local standards, policies, measures, regulations have been promoted in apply in national wide. Since uh, 1999, Beijing began to implementing the European standards Every three to five years, we implementing the new European standards. We head over the national steps. You know, China adopted the before the national six of the. the European standards. The U European standards have a, a special features that uh, the NOx of the limit for the light du duty diesel vehicle is uh, more than three times than the light duty gasoline vehicle. So we ban the light duty diesel vehicles, including the light diesel car. We did not flange from the over from uh, the pressure and the challenge from the different uh, parties and the fields. In fact, by the Beijing policy, there are no many light duty diesel vehicles in China. After 2015 diesel gate scandal exposure, the history proves that our choice is right. We six times upgrade our local fuel standards. And uh, the MMT, after the nearly 10 years struggle, was banned in year 2012. And uh, for Beijing, the China 5 fuel standards also banned MMT. For the Winter Olympic Games, we upgrade our local standards further as the Beijing 6B. And the elephants, aromatics, and the distillation readers in gasoline fields, and as well as the purchase and the distillation syringes in diesel fuel got further improvement. Each, each period, we need hard negotiation with the different levels on the oil company. And Every average needed 
Tan Tan on each period. This picture show that our fuel standards is more are more advanced than the national standards, even the European standards. For the strict law enforcement, we set up all the test laboratory in year 2009 and do the formality of the production and the in use completion test every year. Since the first fine ticket was issued for the access emissions in year 2012, a number of the vehicle company have been punished for the producing or sell vehicles with active emission in Beijing. We set up all the IM program in Beijing. The test light duty vehicle using the American ASS model and uh, test uh, the heavy duty vehicles with the lockdown method learned from the Hong Kong. Strict enforcement was carried on on the regular test stations by on-site inspection, online monitoring, real-time status, and real-time the video to prevent test the cheating. We very focus on the old vehicle retirement. So we set up the low emission zone and the same time we made in incentive policy to encourage the owner of uh, the old, old vehicles to replace the new one. Every year, so we invested more than 1 billion yuan after the year 2009. We set up the remote monitoring platform for heavy duty vehicle because the heavy duty vehicle have uh, the one important uh, feature that uh, the NOx emission is very high. This uh, platform monitoring the OBD NOx urea level. Nowadays, more than 100,000 heavy duty vehicles in this platform. Through this uh, remote monitoring, we can get a clues from the vehicle in use. If the more than 30% of vehicle belong to one company, our fund have problem through these systems, the company will be asked to find the reasons and solve the problem. Otherwise, they will be punished. At the same time, we set up all the local standards for the no roll vehicles. And uh, we do the regular ties. And uh, sometimes 
we gradually set up the low emission zone for high emission, no road vehicles. Before the Beijing Summer Olympic Game, all the gas station and the commercial storage tank trucks were equipped with the vapor recovery systems and the recycling capability. For more efficient, we asked the gasoline station to take a leading implementing online motoring for vapor re recovery. All above the measures taken under the local law have been implemented for more for past 20 years. After more than 20 years effort, the total emission of the motor vehicle dropped from more than 1.6 million tons in 1998 to less than 350,000 tons in 2021. After the reducing emission from the mobile fuels and the other fuels, the Beijing air quality gave great improvement. Thank you very much. A great thank you to Mr. Lee. This year's fourth Hagen Schmidt awardee in the category of environmental policy is Mr. Jorgen Resch. Mr. Resch has worked tirelessly to create broad alliances across non governmental scientific and industrial organizations for bringing forward available technology to reduce air pollution. He has also persistently championed the need for legal jurisdiction of environmental rights and market surveillance and has not hesitated to uncover fraud, including in Germany on the automaker diesel scandal. He is executive director of Environmental Action Germany, one of the most active non-governmental organizations in Germany for clean air policy. He has traveled for Germany to be with us here today. So welcome. So thank you very much for this invitation and having the chance to explain a little bit about my work in the last two or three decades. So please the slides. Next one. Next one, short inter introduction about my organization. We are a nature conservation and at the same time consumer watchdog organization. So we are political independent um, and uh, entitled to bring legal action and um, campaigns only on national and uh, European level. Uh, we focus on clean air, climate protection, resource efficiency, circular economy, and biodiversity. Next. Smog and forest diebacks were 40 years ago the reality in Germany. We had a very awful um, air quality. So um, coming to Deutsche Umwelthilfe 36 years ago, <clears throat> this was still a topic, how to avoid the damage, the health damages, but at the same time, the damage for nature by air pollution. So one of the first big prog um, uh, projects um, we initialized was uh, in mid of the 90s to uh, solve a problem with the acid rain and to reduce sulfur in the fuels. Um, we were very happy that time to use the experience CARP 
had collected here in the US with um, a couple of years ago the implementation of reformulated fuels. And we had a big support by the team and by James Chalk as a former secretary, uh, helping us to repeat the success of Los Angeles and other big cities with reducing the smog. Next slide. Industry promised uh, to bring particulate filter and uh, NOx catalyzer if we help them for clean diesel, for clean fuels. But they cheated. So we had to start a campaign, no diesel without filter. And um, after a really a hard fight, um, in the end 2004, we had a political success and a mandatory implementation of diesel particulate filter was done. Next year, 2005, we um, <clears throat> had the start of a litigation to reduce particle pollution in German cities. Um, and the problem was it was too late. So nearly every city has, a, has had a big problem. Um, so we uh, went to justice and we fight it for the right to, um, to ask the state and the government to do something for clean air. And 2008, we had a groundbreaking decision of the European Court of Justice. Every uh, citizen has a right to clean air and to sue the state. So 70 uh, low emission zone with diesel bans for dirty diesel. We had 2009. And uh, 2010, we started another litigation about another 40 city, cities, partly the same, to achieve also compliance with the binding NO2 limit values. Um, up to now, we didn't lose any single court case. And um, now we have uh, also in line the better air quality. So, but what happened? Next slide. First, this was a situation we still recognized five, six years ago, all the big cities above the limits. Next slide. How this happens? You see here, these are the regulation. Not so good like in the US, but going down for 93% um, for, uh, now this is a, a particulate, but we had a, uh, um, 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 even 99% from um, 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 uh, from Euro 1 and 93% by uh, by NOx, excuse me, I uh, just make a mistake, this is of course the NOx and you have a higher one. Next slide, reality was that the yellow, the emissions increased. So U5 to U1 uh, U to U5 was an increase of 20% and not a decrease of 93%. Next slide. And this is the in total NO2 emission in traffic. So from 1990 to 2016, we, had, we doubled the amount of NO2. It's not NOx, it's really the NO2 emission um, in the inner city. And you see in the light blue, it's mainly the diesel. In the beginning, it was the petrol car here. And with the catalyzator, this problem was solved. But now the diesel brought the problems. Next. Next. So since 2007, we really are blaming about the cheating of car industry. And we showed um, on a side event to the big automotive affair in Frankfurt in detail how car industry are cheating with CO2 and NOx emission. February 2011, we presented, Axel Friedrich was coming with me as the representative of uh, Umweltbundesamt, as the APA, and I got some internal papers and informed the ministry in detail what is happening with a Volkswagen EA189 engine. And they told us, we know, but we have an agreement The cars only have to fulfill the regulation in lab, not on the street. 
So we also published our test results by BMW with 30 times exceeding limits. We um, had 2013 sim similar things to buses. And uh, half a year uh, before um, you made your great job to um, unmantle and to find out and to publish what Volkswagen is doing, we run a, um, a parliamentarian evening, we run press conferences and talks in Brussels about the fraud of car industry with emissions and Jim Strock uh, take place and explain things. The question is, to what extent the diesel scandal could have been minimized if only the responsible ministry would have cared about the early warning they got two and a half years, uh, four and a half years ago? Next. What we did, we started testing because before we were testing in labs and car industry really stopped access to labs. So in the end, we only could uh, go to Switzerland and to uh, use the lab from Professor uh, Levinsky, uh, Chavinsky of uh, the official uh, testing. Um, so we built up an own testing institute. And um, the focal point was, the, was NOx and CO2 emissions, also a little bit particulates and only on street. Next. We developed a, a PEMS track about 22 miles, and a speed track which is really uh, typical for Germany with high speed up to 120 kilometers, I would say 70, 75 miles, and uh, outer city, inner city speeds. Next. And we could see that cars in lab showed very low emission. We drive them outside the lab, partly in the same um, 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 system um, with the real emission. And this we did very often also for hundreds of private court um, uh, uh, lawsuits to help the people to get uh, uh, support by uh, the cheating industry. Next one. And here you see What's the reality? Was, this was the limit, the 80 milligram. And here we have a lot. These are the first cars we, we started to test. And only very few. And it was very, uh, um, I guess, late um, ones, uh, Euro 60. Now uh, they um, fit the limit. All the others were above. Next. If you look to the producers, it's Opel with a General Motors engine. It's Audi, Volkswagen. It's Fiat, Chrysler. It's Renault, Renault, Volvo, Volvo, Mercedes, Opel, Renault again. So it's not only Volkswagen. Volkswagen was even not the worst. We had others. Next. Here, this is the Audi A8, the typical car of our minister. So we, we spoke about the a real joke of uh, the car industry to give the most poisoning car uh, to the environmental minister or to the minister president. It's a, they have a very strange kind of humor because people are suffering. Next. So you see Axel Friedrich, he retired from Umwelt Bundesamt and he is now working uh, in our institute and uh, I'm very happy that he has a old Hagen Smith uh, um, guy. No, now um, um, I have the opportunity to be on the same level like him and he's outstanding and he helped us very much to um, have the opportunity to investigate about 191 vehicles from 22 manufacturers and we did 2,448 single tests and each 32 kilometer. So we could really show that nearly all diesel cars, the older ones, are cheating with defeat devices. And uh, we are very happy that this summer the European Court of Justice announced now the final decision in our claim since three years against the state of Germany that millions of uh, diesel cars still on the street have to be called back 
and really hardware updated. And uh, I just got the information by our parliament that uh, government is now preparing a big budget to support this. I don't understand why the car industry needs the support, but I expect that we will win. I hope so. This will really take place next. The health um, aspects um, are, I think, very hard. Next. We have on one side the health damage by particulates. I think I don't have to go to the details too much. You know it much better, and we learned also a lot from the studies in the US. And um, the next slide shows the health effects of NO2. And um, we have particular risks for small children, elderly people, people with previous illness um, and suffering from asthma and allergies. And we have 9,200 premature deaths, premature deaths in Germany every year, only of, um, of NO2. It's three times more than road accidents. Next. I have 10 years old twins, and uh, so it's for me um, a question how we um, deal with the health problems of, um, yes, of ill people, of poor people. And we have found out uh, that um, along these streets, it's very dirty, it's very loud, the prices are lower. It's families with a lot of children, it's poor families, families who are not fighting for their rights. They are ill people, they are old people. And another trick they do in Germany, they have the opportunity to measure between one and a half meter and four meter. And in most states, they measure in four meter high. So we found out with our studies that, of course, you have a higher concentration down in one meter, one and a half meter than above. So you can manipulate the data. Next. It's not only the work on um, air quality and clean air. I only want to show you also one slide about uh, a groundbreaking decision. We work extremely hard um, in the field of uh, climate protection and against uh, fossil oil and natural gas. And two years ago, um, or two and a half years ago, an 11 years old girl wrote a letter to me. She wanted to sue the state uh, if I can, could help her. And I was thinking, what, what do I answer? And she, she, she wrote, I want that the people in 100 to 150 years still know what is no. So um, I was with my lawyer. And he, in, the, in the, that evening, we found out, oh, okay, we were preparing a, um, um, a lawsuit because of climate. And we are thinking who could be the, um, the person or the persons who are the right, who have right to sue. So we had Bangladeshis and Nepalese uh, people. Um, and we did a new one for uh, young people, for children. And this... Um, um, uh, lawsuit was successful. Our uh, constitutional court um, one year ago decided uh, to change one article, um, the article 21, uh, 20A, to an article for climate protection and the right of uh, young people for their future. And the government had to change the climate law and um, a lot of other lawsuits now gives us the opportunity to urge to do more. And um, so this is very important for us. Next slide. My last one, what we want to do next, Clean Air 2.0. This award for me is a motivation and it's something I really want to um, now finish. We fight it successful for weak limits. Let's fight for real limits. And World, World Health Organization um, studied for years what is the right number for um, these uh, emissions we have to reduce. And finally, in September last year, they come out with very 
ambitious limits for NO2 PM2.5, PM10, so 75 to 80 percent more ambitious. We will run an international conference in uh, October um, um, in honor of that um, also uh, award. And uh, we want to speed up the implementation of this um, revision of air quality and to bring the the WHO recommendation as soon as possible on European and national level um, in right. So everybody is invited to support us with his advice or, if you know, partners who could um, even fund us. Um, so next slide. Thank you very much. to hear about your and are continuing to do. I'm honored to introduce Dr. Stevens. Several of his publications have been highly influential research milestones and have impacted important policies, including the Clean Air Act. Dr. Schwartz is a senior scientist emeritus at Brookhaven National Laboratory, where he has been on the scientific staff since 1975. We're very fortunate to have Dr. Schwartz with us here today. Dr. Schwartz. Thank you for that introduction. Thank you, CARB, for this uh, award and for the invitation to be here. Um, thank you to the audience for being here, giving me somebody to talk to. Uh, oh, and I want to talk about is, is a little bit of uh, history and uh, what I think is a success story. So if we can start with the first slide. That's the last one. No, 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 don't show that one. <laughs> There, uh, keep going. There we go. Uh, not yet. Go back one. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah, um, so the, the title is um, How Does the Acid Get Into the Rain? This is maybe a little bit of ancient history, but we've heard uh, uh, Jürgen just speak a bit about um, the sour rain, the acid rain in Germany. And um, it, it's, it's in, in many ways, um, uh, an important object lesson and example of how to how we uh, can make some environmental progress. Um, I want to explicitly acknowledge support from the United States Department of Energy. I'm at Brookhaven National Laboratory on Long Island, New York. Um, our work is supported almost entirely by the U United States Department of Energy and. Um, a point that I try to make is that uh, good science requires sustained support. We can't uh, ramp up and ramp down and, and retain quality staff and, and quality science. Um, so I'm very honored to have this opportunity to make this presentation and um, the, the, um, to receive the Hagen Schmidt uh, Clean Air Award. Let me go to the next slide, which is a kind of a metaphor and the metaphor is that um, uh, a three-legged stool, you, you need uh, for stability, you can't have a stool with two legs, you need three in laboratory studies, field measurements, and theory. Um, and only with that sound understanding that's based on these elements of research can we formulate sound policy. And so that's, that's the metaphor of that particular slide. Let's go forward. So the question is, how does the acid get into the rain? When I was hired at Brookhaven National Laboratory in 1975, uh, the man who hired me said, this is your charge. Uh, go at it. And um, this, well, what was the conventional wisdom at the time? Um, the conventional wisdom was that sulfur dioxide, well, we know the acid constituents of acid rain is, is nitric acid and sulfur, sulfuric acid. 
Sulfur dioxide is rapidly oxidized in clear air, clear meaning not cloud, to sulfuric acid and uh, subsequently incorporated into clouds and then rain. Um, nitrogen dioxide, we all know as chemists uh, from our early laboratory experience, back in the days when, when students were allowed to work with real chemicals in real laboratories and not virtual chemist, chemicals on, on, on a Zoom call. Um, so we all know that nitrogen dioxide reacts rapidly with liquid water, this reacts rapidly in clouds to form nitric and nitrous acids. So that's the conventional wisdom. Already at that time, uh, there, were, there were some uh, chips in this, uh, in, in this uh, edifice. Uh, there, uh, the studies done in um, uh, plumes, in, in, in plumes from uh, electric power generating plants, um, you can use the wind speed and the distance as a clock. And, and those studies were starting to show that sulfur dioxide wasn't so rapidly oxidized uh, in, in clear air and non-cloud air. So that was part of the motivation uh, for uh, the this, this study that I'm going to be talking about. Next slide, please. So this is the theory piece of, of the three-legged stool. It's work that I did with a man named John Freiberg. Um, he's an expert in sulfur chemistry. I didn't know much about sulfur chemistry. I didn't know much about mass transport either, but I had to learn these kinds of things. So we really examined the, the, the processes that are involved in the aqueous phase, liquid phase, water phase, oxidation of sulfur dioxide. And it was known at the time that uh, sulfur dioxide reacts with ozone, it reacts with hydrogen peroxide, gets oxidized um, to sulfuric acid. But if, first it has to get into the drop, and then you have to have chemistry. And there were a lot of questions in a quantitative sense how rapid this could be. And if you look at what we physical chemists call fugacity, which is the partial pressure on the gas side, and then we can divide by the Henry's Law solubility coefficient, get that in terms of, of what we call the fugacity. Where is the drop? Is it taking place in the gas side diffusion? Is it taking place at the interface mass transport limitation? Is it taking place in, in the water side or is it uniform on the water side? So this, these were the questions we tried to pose and then uh, wrote a paper on it. And we submitted the paper to the journal Atmospheric Environment. Um, and it got rejected. And why? The reviewers said, well, you didn't have anything new to say, and it's a long paper. Um, and it got, the paper got rejected. We got dejected. Here I am, a, a young scientist trying to make my career, and my first big paper on the subject, and it gets rejected. Um, we struggled with, with that for a while. We finally uh, negotiated with the editor, well... Um, if you split it into two, so it's not so long, and um, it, it, of course you'll pay the page charges, so we, we agreed to pay the page charges, and the paper got published. And gradually, it, it, it took hold, and people started to recognize this, this is not just for the sulfur dioxide reactions, but also more broadly for any reaction that involves the multiphase. So next slide, please. Ultimately, this paper took off and, and got a lot of uh, citations and, and got a lot of use, more importantly. And as I mentioned this morning, uh, the journal Atmospheric Environment uh, initiated what they called then the Hagen Schmidt Award. Uh, and the Hagen Schmidt Award for that journal was for an outstanding paper published in that journal. So some 20 years later, uh, we got this award from the journal for a paper which had initially been rejected as not having anything new to say. So I take a lot of satisfaction in that. Um, and, and, and don't mind telling the story about getting a, having a paper rejected, but it's, it's, it's a, it got a, it got a story that has a happy ending. Um, okay, so that's that side of, of the uh, leg of the three-legged stool. Let's move forward. Next slide. Um, this is field measurements, and I've got a couple of slides dealing with field measurements. Um, we anticipated that the reaction, based on, on the theory, that the reaction between peroxide and sulfur dioxide in clouds would, would be rapid and go to completion uh, on a rather short time scale. And so this is a field study then where we measured 
simultaneously, hydrogen peroxide plotted on the vertical axis, sulfur dioxide plotted on the horizontal axis, and looked to see if both are present. And it was a, it's a, it was a tough set of measurements. We had to rigorously exclude situations where the cloud was broken and we had pieces of non-cloud air in our samplings. We, we did that. We did that very carefully. And basically, we were finding you either have one or the other, that the reaction goes to completion. It's, it's a limiting reagent reaction. Us chemists are familiar with that, which, which one is in excess gets left over. And so that was, we thought, was a very important demonstration measurements of the, accuracy of, of, of the accuracy of the theoretical predictions. Next slide. Okay, this is um, uh, an, another study that is, is, again, field measurements. I have to introduce this. The, con the concept is that, okay, you have a reaction that goes to completion in cloud drops, but most clouds don't precipitate. Clouds mostly evaporate. And when the cloud droplets evaporate, they leave behind an aerosol particle, and that aerosol particle is then subject subsequently to incorporation in clouds. This process happens uh, multiple times. The particles that become ult ultimately um, raindrops um, may have experienced uh, uh, being cloud droplets for a dozen times before they ultimately become a raindrop. It's still a mystery. Um, in the sense of how does how do the, the rain form from the cloud droplets? And it, it's an active uh, area of research all these years later. We don't really have a good description of that. But uh, okay, that's the background, and we called it efficient scavenging of aerosol sulfate uh, by liquid water clouds. I, th I think what we would now call is, is efficient activation or activation scavenging. Uh, we, were, we were kind of inventing this field as we were going along. So what you have here is time series. So this is 20 minutes across, uh, uh, sorry, 40 minutes across from 2010 GMT to 2050. Um, and what are the quantities that are being measured? And the top panel is cloud liquid water content. And it's a broken, uh, what we call stratiform cloud, broken strata cumulus cloud. You're flying in the plane. You've all been in planes. You look outside the window and you think you're in clouds, but sometimes you can see the, the wingtip. Sometimes you can't. Uh, sometimes you have more visibility. Not There's a broken strata cumulus cloud. And the liquid water content is, is measured readily, and that's what's shown in the top panel. You can see it fluctuating rapidly on the, on the time scales that are shown here. And the next panel is what we in those days called B-scat, light scattering coefficient. Terminology has changed. The quantity is the same. And what we were observing, you can see right here, for example, when liquid water content is low, close to zero, the light scattering coefficient is high. Now, what light scattering co This is not the cloud light scattering coefficient. This is the light scattering coefficient in the air between the cloud droplets. We filtered out the cloud droplets. We're looking at the air. So if there's liquid water content, the light scattering coefficient is scavenged away and, and vice versa. And that's what we were noticing in the, in the comparison of those top two panels. And we also had at that time... Um, a newly developed, very cantankerous instrument to measure sulfate. Um, it was a converted instrument that measured SO2. We had to collect the particles. We had to evaporate the particles. We had to zero the instrument uh, I don't know, every 20 minutes or something like that. We would turn off the signal and, and, because the instrument was drifting like mad. But what we were able to do was see, look, here, here's an area where there's high light scattering coefficient, low liquid water content high sulfate, and, and it looked like a pattern. And then one of us rather cleverly said, well, look, take this, this rapidly measured light scattering coefficient, impose a time constant on it, and then uh, comparable to that on the sheet, and they tracked, you can pretty much almost set one on, on top of the other. So we're not saying that all the light scattering coefficient of this aerosol haze, if you wish, is due to sulfate, but they, they track perfectly and, and established the very efficient scavenging. So the particles get scavenged into the cloud droplets. The cloud droplets still have to become rain. But that, again, in terms of, of that part of the process, again, we nailed it. Okay, let's go to the next one. This is uh, the third leg of the stool. This has to do with uh, laboratory measurements, and in this case, the nitrogen dioxide. Um, and... Um, 
uh, it doesn't look like a very complicated apparatus. And it's not a complicated apparatus. It's, 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 uh, the glass blower made it. Uh, we put in some electrodes. We could m basically take air, put water into here, push the air through the water, some nitrogen dioxide, and measure the extent of reaction by conductivity. And we got that uh, uh, rate constant, nailed that one. What we also got was the solubility coefficient of nitrogen dioxide, what we call in our trade the Henry's Law coefficient. And not surprisingly, it's a bent triatomic molecule that um, uh, uh, doesn't undergo any hydration. It's just like ozone. It's, it's, it's one, electro, one electron shy of being ozone. Um, it's, it's nitrogen dioxide instead of oxygen dioxide. And the Henry's Law coefficient is just about the same. Um, but we didn't know that. And we got that as a byproduct. And once we knew the solubility of nitrogen dioxide, it didn't matter what the rate coefficient was for that reaction. It's so insoluble. It's a bimolecular reaction. It's a second order reaction. It can't react fast enough to make the acid. So again, disproving the, what was then the conventional wisdom. So how does nitric acid get into the rain? NO2 gets, how does nitrogen dioxide get into the rain? NO2 gets oxidized by free radical reaction. Um, the free radicals can make nitric acid if, if the, the nitrogen oxide is, is high enough. Otherwise, they go to make hydrogen peroxide that goes to make ozone. So uh, one way or the other, those free radicals are playing an, an important part. Um, uh, so again, uh, another leg, uh, uh, another piece of, of, of the stool from the laboratory measurements. Okay, next slide. So those were findings papers. This was a paper that I wrote in 1989, and it's basically negative findings. Um, difficult to determine detailed relations between emissions and resulting acid deposition. Uh, credible source receptor relations are not at, yet at hand. So those are negative results. But then we could reach a conclusion that with confidence, regional deposition will be reduced equivalently to reduction in regional emissions. And publish the paper. And then some years later, I was at a scientific conference, environmental conference, gave my talk. Those of you who are scientists give talks at meetings. You give your talk. By the end of your talk, your adrenaline has gone away completely. You're dead. Um, and go to, I'm walking staggering towards my seat. And the next speaker comes up. And she says, well, I'm very pleased to be on a platform with uh, Stephen Schwartz. Well, I could tell from that, one, I was surprised to hear my name, better pay attention. Two, Stephen Schwartz, uh, nobody calls me Stephen except my wife. Um, so she didn't know me. It was this, okay, so, so what does she have to say? And what she had to say was that this paper came out just at the time the EPA was trying to formulate the amendments to the Clean Air Act that would limit the acid deposition. And they were getting nowhere with it, and they were struggling with it. And then all of a sudden comes out my paper, and they say, well, we don't have to worry about the details. What we want to do is control the emissions in the aggregate, and then come up with that, which ultimately became uh, the emissions trading. You grant um, trading rights to the current emitters, and then they can trade them around and, and, and the economics of that, and it became uh, the, the mode of doing it. So um, I had no idea of, of that, that influence of this paper and, until that scientific conference. And, and, and ultimately, as a consequence, he recognized it and gave it an award. But um, I, I, was, I was kind of opposed from a policy perspective that um, New York and New England had really previously reduced their sulfur emissions tremendously. And now come, some, it comes along the government, we're going to grant trading rights to the current emitters. And, and New York had already paid once uh, in the office, and they were going to pay again when, when these, uh, because of the emission rights trading. But New York, I think, wisely said, we don't care about that. We, what we really care about is, is the acid deposition, and this is the way forward, and so we're going to go ahead with that. So um, that's a, the result of a paper that really didn't have any findings. Okay, let's go ahead. Um, here's the result. 
And the result was that this strategy worked. This is a before and after picture of acid deposition, specifically sulfate deposition in the United States from a measurement network. And this measurement network shows that the, the strategy worked. And, and so irrespective of, of, of anything else and, and the, the, the policy implications, this strategy worked. And I call that a success story. Next slide. I think it's my last one. This is the one I didn't want you to see um, at, the, at the very beginning. Um, this is uh, Dr. Hagen-Smith in, I guess, a moment of relaxation in his laboratory. Um, they, uh, there, there are many things one can argue with about that, uh, his behavior in that particular uh, setting. Uh, I won't get into them, but there's, there's safety issues as well as anything else. But um, the, uh, the quotation I particularly like, um, there are, this is from his PNAS paper in 1970. Um, and I think it, 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 it's, it's very foresightful. It, it, um, there are ominous signs that control technology alone is not able to cope with the ever-increasing growth in population and all its polluting activities. Today, we realize that we have always been too timid in setting our goals. And I think that still holds. So I want to leave you with that thought, and I want to thank you for the opportunity to make this presentation. I want to thank CARB for the award. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Fortz. Uh, our final 2020-2021 Hoggerschmidt Award winner today is in the category of Air Quality Science and Technology is Professor David Kettleson. He is considered the world leader and pioneer of diesel emission research. His research at the frontier of combustion engine emission studies provided the fundamental foundational knowledge of diesel part particle formation that enabled today's current stringent regulations. He is the Frank Rowley Professor of Mechanical Engineering at the University of Minnesota, where he has been a professor since 1980. He has traveled all the way from Croatia to be with us here today. So welcome. Thank you. Well, thank you. I'm uh, very happy to be here today and with all of you. I've enjoyed all the talks today. I, I guess I have the advantage of having listened to you all and enjoyed it all. And now what am I gonna to do to top this? <laughs> I'd like to take a little different perspective. I'm going to give uh, what is really a, a sort of history talk. I'm gonna tr talk about uh, basically how we got where we are today with particle emission measurements. So if I could go ahead with the first slide, skip that one, that's all right, go ahead. Okay, one of the things that really inspired me early on that made me want to get into the measurement of particles from engines was some work that Ken Whitby did here in California. He measured particles upstream and uh, upwind and downwind of a major California freeway. And what he found was that the difference between the upwind and downwind, and you can see upwind, downwind, and the difference, that's run 54 minus 55. There was a huge number of primary particles being emitted over the freeway by vehicles. This was a large primary emission source that clearly needed to be dealt with and recognized. And that was one of the things that really brought me into working with the Particle Technology Lab and with our engine laboratory, trying to deal with this and reduce these emissions. And that led to the next slide. This was the first time I'd really joined the team in the Particle Technology Laboratory. And uh, there was a lot of concern in the 1975 when catalytic converters were added to uh, gasoline cars. The concern was that these oxidizing catalysts would oxidize sulfur in the fuel and lead to huge concentrations of sulfuric acid. The modeling calculations were really scary. They were so scary that there was a, a research study done at General Motors, 360 vehicles, brand new vehicles, were driven around the GM test track and emissions were measured roadside and on road. I had the opportunity of helping to build a little 
on-road emission laboratory, and these are some of the emission measurements we made. We found that the on-road aerosol was trimodal. We had a nucleation mode around 20 nanometers, an accumulation mode around 200 nanometers, and then some coarse particles above a micron or so. The nucleation mode was primarily sulfuric acid. Now, that looks like a lot of sulfuric acid, but it was about a tenth of what had been predicted in the modeling. And the sulfuric acid problem was later uh, uh, largely eliminated by reformulation of the oxidizing catalyst, and then finally the introduction of three-way catalyst, which had much less of a problem that way. But this diagram really sort of started me thinking about how to describe tailpipe emissions. And now looking at the next slide, here this slide I've shown a million times. I'm sure you're all bored by it. But this basically took that measurement and said, okay, from the tailpipe emissions from engines, whether it's a diesel spark ignition, even aircraft look like this, uh, you'll have a, 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 a tiny nucleation mode, uh, the blue curve, where most of the particle number is. This is typically semi-volatile particles and some ash from lube oil or fuel. Uh, then you'll have uh, the red dotted curve, that's a, a mass distribution curve. Uh, most of the mass coming out of vehicles is typically around 100 to 200 uh, uh, nanom uh, nanometers in diameter. This we call the accumulation mode. It's primarily uh, soot aggregates. And then we have a third mode, a coarse mode. This is usually the same soot that's been deposited on insulin surfaces and then blown off of the surfaces and re-entrained as well as uh, crankcase fumes from vehicles that don't have to, uh, closed crankcases. And of course, one thing that's outdated uh, uh, on this chart is we've started to realize just how important brake and tire wear is. And those emissions would be uh, especially adding to the course mode, although those emissions go across the board. But in any case, this diagram really focused my research over the years. So next slide. So I'd like to give you a little bit of history. Next slide. Uh, people have been measuring particles for a long time, particles from engines. I had a 1953 Plymouth convertible that I was very proud of. Well, somebody measured the particle emissions from a 1954 Plymouth convertible <laughs> that had exactly the same engine. And these are the particles they found. Look at this. Everything is submicron aggregates. And these aren't soot. These are lead these are really nasty things. And so you look at the lead compounds there and look at the relative uh, contributions, 22 out of 30, and I'm not sure of the units, uh, uh, my, uh, milligrams per minute came out as lead compounds. So this is really bad stuff coming from the old leaded fuel vehicles. Another study on gasoline, early gasoline vehicles, next slide, next slide. This is an impactor study where uh, it was an inertial impactor that could uh, count particles between 10 uh, uh, microns down to uh, 350 nanometers. So this couldn't go down into the nucleation mode range, but uh, really picked up the accumulation mode and the coarse particle mode. What you see on the left is a test done with unleaded gasoline and on the right with leaded gasoline. And again, you see the huge impact of lead. Most of the lead was coming out in this accumulation mode, six times more in that range with lead compared to without lead. So lead was a big player. Okay, next slide, please. So the thing that really made it possible to do a lot of my measurements was the development of near real-time portable instruments, a TEM measurement of electron microscope. It's time consuming, it tells you a lot, but it takes a lot of time, it's far from being real time. An impact factor measurement is faster, but it's still, you have to prepare substrates, you have to do this and that. So it still takes a lot of time. The development of the electrical aerosol analyzer allowed you to get size distribution in a couple of minutes. And that changed everything. And there have been subsequent instruments developed. I'm not going to talk about details. But this was a key instrument that allowed a lot of new measurements to be made. So let's go ahead. I uh, made my first measurements of diesel. Uh, this was a, a, an Oliver tractor engine, a turbocharged diesel. 
And we tried to simulate atmospheric dilution with that simple dilution system, an aspiration orifice uh, that went across the tailpipe. And then we uh, measured the particles in, uh, with the electrical aerosol analyzer. You had to have a steady aerosol source. So we had a sample bag and we sampled from the sample bag going to electrical aerosol analyzer. And sure enough, when we looked, we saw this bimodal structure that you see in the GM sulfate experiment. At full load, we had most of an accumulation, uh, mostly accumulation mode particles. At light load, we had mostly nucleation mode particles. And at intermediate load, again, we had in the submicron region, a clear nucleation mode, a clear accumulation mode. Going forward, next slide. So over the years, I did a lot of studies trying to say, how should we sample these particles? What's the best way to do this? And I think our most important contribution here was a study uh, that Imad colleague did uh, for his PhD thesis. He built a two-stage variable uh, dilution ratio system where you had a first stage with a residence chamber where you had very time, temperature, humidity, uh, and the uh, dilution ratio. And then a second dilution system that quickly diluted out to several hundred to one, basically freeze the, uh, the particle physics. And he found some very interesting results. So let's go to the next slide. He found that when you varied uh, the residence time in this system, it had no effect on soot. The soot was stable, as you'd expect, soot is soot. But, we could change by a hundredfold, by a hundredfold, the number of nanoparticles. So this showed this fantastic sensitivity to dilution conditions. Doing the same thing, but varying temperature, keeping the other variables constant, we found you could get about a 50-fold change as you went from 30 degrees centigrade in the primary system to 65 degrees uh, centigrade in the primary system. Now the question is, is this real? Is it some laboratory artifact? Well, we did a, a, a lot of work with mobile laboratories. So the next slide, this shows a, a, a large mobile laboratory. It's very large because Volvo said, we'll give you a big truck, put a, 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 put a container with a laboratory in it, and you can have the truck, you know, a $130,000 truck. Uh, so we built this laboratory. We did chase experiments. We drove uh, 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 upwind and downwind the freeways. We, we uh, cruised around on, on urban highways, et cetera, and did lots of measurements. It's, this was paid for by coordinating research pro uh, 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 console uh, in the E43 project. And they were really interested in finding out are these nanoparticles you're measuring real? Okay, next slide. So we did measurements. Uh, th these are some measurements we did actually in, in, in conjunction with uh, uh, Gunther Uberstorser. Uh, we were actually using the mobile laboratory. We were carrying rats in the laboratory. But uh, as an auxiliary measurement, the rats were getting this but we wanted to see what the roadway aerosols were look, looking like. We were breathing the same thing as the rats, so we weren't discriminating against them. But uh, basically the left uh, uh, panels, the left-hand side of the left panel shows number distribution in the nucleation mode range. And the blue curve is just the raw measurement. The red curve is when you put a thermal to neuter in. 96% reduction of particles in that range putting in the thermal denuder. So nearly everything in the nucleation mode over the roadway was semi-volatile and removed by a thermal denuder. When we looked at the right-hand side, that's a volume-weighted distribution. There, the thermal uh, diluter, uh, denuder removed a lot, but nothing like the amount with the nucleation mode. Now, why did we get reduction there? You're saying it should be soot. Well, there's a lot of background aerosol there. There's a lot of uh, 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 semi-volatile material in the background aerosol. So that's why we got the reduction there. The other thing we saw, we did many days of, of driving on New York freeways. And so we had different temperatures. And we found just, just like what we saw in the laboratory, as ambient temperature changed, the relative size of the nucleation mode changed. So the on-road measurements were very consistent with the laboratory measurements. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, so that uh, brings me to
to the sort of final things that I'd like to say. Right now, we don't have a number standard in the United States. Europeans have a, a solid number standard. We don't have a number standard. And we know from roadway measurements that there's a lot of tiny semi-volatile particles out there. And personally, I think they should be measured. If we're going to measure them, though, we want to measure them in the way that represents what we breathe. We found the formation of semi-volatile particles is very sensitive to dilution and sampling conditions. The design of the sampling and dilution system is its least, and I think more important than the instruments. The instruments, we can get good instruments, but you can really get it wrong if you don't use sampling and dilution correctly. Right now, there's no perfect lab sampling and dilution system. I showed you our two-stage system. There are many systems. The key, though, is you want to simulate atmospheric dilution. You need something where you have primary dilution taking place at moderate temperatures, 25, 30 degrees centigrade, and a moderate uh, a dilution ratio. Then you'll get a reasonable simulation. But it's not perfect, but it's at least somewhat predictive. We definitely don't suggest heated dilution because you won't see any semi-volatile materials. And that is real material. That's material we breathe. Now, the European Union has, measured, has developed a really effective measurement system for regulating solid particles from engines. That's a PMP system. It works great for solids, but it's not designed for semi-volatile particles. And we have to remember that. I've seen many people saying, we know how to measure particle number. The Europeans have developed it. They've got a good system. But it's not for measuring what we breathe. It's for measuring a regulatory standard. And it was originally intended, and maybe uh, some of my European colleagues might not agree, but the whole idea of the PMP program was to make people put on filters. And it's very good for forcing you to put a filter on. If we had a solid number set in the United States, we wouldn't be arguing about whether gasoline direct injection engines need filters. In Europe, it's, the filters on gasoline direct injection are universally adopted, but because we don't have a number standard, we can meet mass standards without filters. And I'm probably offending some of my CARB friends because I know they think just going to tight mass standards will be enough. But I wish we could force filters on gasoline uh, direct injection vehicles as well. Anyway, that's my thought for today. Thank you for listening. Uh, and I feel so honored and privilege to have been uh, given this award. Th thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Kettleson. We actually have presentations um, before the end, but I first wanted to just congratulate and thank um, all of the awards and thank everybody for um, today. And okay, there it goes. Um, but I do want to to Dr. Alan Lloyd for a few brief uh, presentations. There'll be two presentations. Um, he is a member of the Hogwarts Advisory Committee, which oversees of nominations, reviews nomination packages, and presents their recommendations for. I was pausing because I knew we had a, a video presentation from Mita, but um, this comes first, I understand. Uh, and this is, this is prepared by staff, but this combination of it's made on behalf of uh, Martin Williams, and they're prepared by Richard Mills and also Mike Walsh, and maybe a little bit input from Catherine Witherspoon as well. Um, some of us here maybe many of us know Martin Williams. Um, so I'm gonna read this text. I hope I won't be cut off uh, before my allotted time, but we'll see. Since the last round of Hagen Schmidt Awards, the atmospheric science and policy community has lost one of its towering figures, Professor Martin Williams. A man who began his professional career with distinguished contributions 
on the formation and dispersion of tropospheric air ozone, they feel that Hagen Schmidt has made his own. It is not possible for Professor Williams to be considered as a candidate for Hagen, official Hagen Schmidt award due to his sudden and unexpected death just before the nomination process for this year's award. And I will say they deliberated on this in terms of how do you recognize someone who is, is, is deceased? But in this case, unexpected death. Martin would obviously have been a, a nominee head, head. Uh, so it would have come up and uh, we all knew him there. However, uh, because he had such outstanding credentials, it was decided to, to the by the chair, and that is my chair, uh, to chair, to give uh, Professor Martin Williams this special recognition. He leaves an enormous legacy to air quality science and policy, and it's important that this should not pass unrecognized. We would therefore like to take a few moments to recall the man, his achievements, and his legacy. Um, and some of these you may be familiar with. I was not some of them, and so it's really important to put this in context, and I think uh, you would recognize that he rises to the caliber of uh, uh, deserving this, this, uh, nomin uh, this um, mention. Two factors especially distinguish Professor Williams' work. First, he's a preeminent at the critical interface between science and policy. Second, he was one of the first truly international figures in our field. Originally motivated by the impact of a pollution in the Welsh mining valleys where he grew up, and we share Welsh heritage there, he contributed significantly to the work of some of our key institutions, including the US EPA, Health Effects Institute, and the International Council on Clean Trans Transportation. He also became a leading figure in air pollution policy in the European Union and across the Northern Hemisphere. Through his long leadership at the Conventions for Long Range Transboundary Air Pollution and increasingly at the global scale through his contribution to the World Health Organization's work. A few examples may serve to highlight the scale of Professor Williams's contribution to air quality. Early in his career, he led uh, he led the group that produced the first real-world measurements of emissions from vehicles, work on which the automaker diesel data, Dieselgate data was to build upon some 20 years later. He then played a leading role in European vehicle emission reduction negotiations, working closely with U.S. partners. And I'm sure he worked with Hugo and Axel in some of those areas. As head of the air quality science team for the U.K. government, he was responsible for another landmark providing the scientific underpinning for a comprehensive national air quality strategy to integrate policy across the UK government and across the full range of pollutants in developing the underlying science. That was at the time when US, UK was operating independent of the European Union, and so maybe it was easier to get some uh, stuff through at that time. He had few precedents on which to draw, so he managed to develop important new approaches which are now a common practice. Most notably, he developed effective assessment and modeling tools that could show the comparative benefits of alternative policy options for reducing ambient pollution levels and health effects. With impact, uh, with difficult choices between alternative policies becoming unavoidable, this work was invaluable. This work and set the direction for the emerging air quality standards uh, in the European Union, helping to provide scientific basis for legislation and air quality guidelines and the establishment of the first enforceable air quality limit values for particulate matter, nitrogen dioxide, and other key pollutants. At the time when some of the member states were uncertain about following these new air quality public health mandates, Professor Williams' steady voice and firm first-hand experience implementing change at the national level helped the EU uh, automakers make this important step. Over the years, the guidelines have significantly reduced air pollution across Europe. In 2015, he went on to co-chair the WHO workshop, a group which oversaw the formulation of the new air quality guidelines that were released by the World Health Organization last year. Sadly, 
shortly after his untimely death. These guidelines will now play a secondary role in guiding countries around the world as they develop action toward cleaner air. As the importance of his work increased, Professor Williams had, be, had become someone who not only understood the science, but also someone who could help manage and deliver change. These skills became increasingly visible in two final areas of achievement that require mention. For a decade, Professor Williams led the UNEC Convention on Long-Range Transport of Air Pollution, the premier international body on air pollution. Never an easy task with a diverse men membership embracing North America, Europe, and Russia. His initial contribution was to help develop the second sulfur protocol, the first fully science-based international atmospheric, atmospheric policy agreement. Later as chair, he successfully negotiated three further international agreements, culminating in the review of the multi-pollutant Gothenburg Protocol. To the challenging task of leading the convention, he brought perception, humor, and a well-honed understanding of what was and was not realistically achievable. Finally, Professor Williams was among the first to recognize the importance of early action on short-lived climate pollutants for mitigating climate change and reducing global air pollution. He contributed uh, to this cause in numerous ways, including by contributing critically to the Stockholm Conference that brought the issue of pro uh, to prominence. Definitely chair in the conference that convened to, exploring the to explore the policy in implications. He was also a lead contributor on policy issues for the WMO UNEP report that set the course on short-lived climate pollutant policy for the following decade. He stayed a key figure until the work on the short-lived climate pollutant uh, policy had gathered its own momentum with the commitment of the United States and the launch of the CCAC, that is the Climate and Clean Air Coalition. So we're joined here both the climate and the air pollution through the short-lived uh, pollutants. And I know firsthand, having participated in a conference with Martin in London, uh, that he really played an invaluable role. Across all these fields, Professor Martin Williams was a towering figure, as the Hagen Schmidt's awards are designed to recognize. He leaves an enduring legacy for the generation of atmospheric scientists and policy makers to follow him. Thank you. And now we're going to play a short video to recognize two tiring members of the advisory committee, uh, Michael Walsh and Arthur Weiner. So if we could please play the video. Arthur, I'm so happy that I have had the chance to meet with you and interact with you in this platform of Hagen Smith Cleaner Award. Your perceptiveness and discerning ideas have enriched our thought process and given us deep insight and also helped us perspective the remarkable accomplishments of the awardees within a broader framework of global change, particularly the way you have underscored the importance of recognizing the new frontiers of climate and clean air science while underpinning the importance of environmental justice to give a human face to change. Wish you the very best for all your future work. Michael, as we the jury members say bye to you today and you pass on the baton to us, we deeply feel and recognize your strong legacy of wisdom and keen sense of judgment that you are leaving behind with all of us. You have contributed to raise the bar for Hagen Smith Clean Air Award and define the exacting milestones for the change makers who are ahead of their times. You yourself as an awardee of this award have set 
new frontiers to influence regulatory action on vehicular pollution around the world and help build science in public domain to influence change. You have always made complex issues so easy for all of us to understand and to act on. I hope you will certainly not stop here, but continue to influence clean air and climate action. Lots of best wishes. For some of those who are not, not aware what the role of the nomination committee is, um, and that is, and, and Michael and Arthur, and I say but, uh, but both of them, are stepping down from that. But the nomination was set up uh, by the board, or, or by the staff or the board, both, I guess, um, to bring nomination uh, and uh, recommendations to the chair of the board. Um, and these are recommendations. The chair makes the final decision, uh, which is which is very important. We're trying to, we st start out as, as, as a smaller group, but it was uh, myself uh, when I stepped down from chair, and then Michael and Arthur, we'd all work together. Then we added, relatively recently, uh, Fran Pavley, because it was recognized three white males that's not good in many ways. But also we had limited in diversity in terms of our technical strengths. And then we, uh, we added um, uh, looking, uh, we needed more um, diversity. So we added two also very strong people to the nominating committee. Uh, Judy Chow, Professor Chow, who you know, who's not a shrinking violet, uh, and also Anamita Rao Chowdhury, who as you saw there, she's just such a wonderful champion fighting for clean air in Delhi and in India generally. She is a past winner. And you can see she together with um, uh, Li Kunshang represent formidable people to, uh, to, in, to uh, basically push for cleaner air using all the tools at their disposal and particularly Anamita has done that with a legal group in uh, Delhi. I mention that because both, both uh, Lee uh, Kunshang and Anamita are basically disciples of Michael Walsh. Michael uh, was very sad to see him step down, but I, I understand. He uh, has done more globally for cleaning up emissions control for motor vehicles than anyone I know. Um, he was an awardee, so I'm not going to repeat all the accolades at that time. But since that time, he has uh, continued to spread his wings internationally. He's continued to fight the Ethel Corporation globally. He's made sure that people understand the importance of three things. You have to look at the emissions, you have to look at the fuels, and then you have to set tight regulations, but also you have to have compliance. And when I was at ICC, I participated with Michael on two uh, large reports, one on what should be done in China, the other on what should be done in India. But he is, a, he is an icon, and we will miss him, and I will miss him, but I know he's a phone call away uh, in terms of needing that help. But on top of that, he is such a um, delightful individual. Um, and so you, know, you would never recognize that he was a, a MacArthur Fellow and has all the accolades. And, and I think he, um, what's, he got the China Freedom Award as well. So he will be missed, uh, and he's played an outstanding role. And of course, one of the, I think he's one of the early uh, awardees in there. Second one, of course, is uh, Professor uh, Arthur Weiner. I first met Arthur when we both worked here in the early 1970s, and Arthur had come down from uh, Professor uh, Pimental at uh, Berkeley and to work here, and Arthur worked 
on some of the early work to, to resolve the ozone discrepancy. How do you measure it? Which gets back to, to policy. If you can't measure it, how can you set good policy? Um, but he got a, he's got a, a, his uh, Hagen Schmidt Award. But since that time, obviously, he's continued to do great things. And I was delighted to see his work w w with you uh, at UCLA and his Anamita recognizing the work in environmental justice. He also br brought outstanding input to the nominating committee, um, particularly on the science. And uh, we look to Arthur to say, does that live up to the standards? And recognize we have people coming forward and we cannot, the committee cannot nominate anybody. So you try to be impartial there, but also we try to look at the basically a lifetime of work or a long record of work. We have some people are nominated for us who are maybe shooting stars, but we recognize that maybe their time will come. So I was delighted today and I will miss Arthur also very much as he spends a summer up in Anacortes Island and the winter down in Laguna. I can't say, I, I envy him, I envy him that, so give him that choice. Uh, but again, today, as I listen to the presentations, I'm truly str struck by the choices we made, the recommendations that were made. Uh, these were truly outstanding contributions, outstanding talks which will, will basically tend to, uh, will, last the, will last the test of time. Um, we, can only nom we can only look at the nominations. I can't stress, which you stressed here today, the importance of the colleagues who recommended you. We've had some people who recommend themselves. When we look at the people who some of past water winners and we recognize the caliber of those nominees. That was thing. So I think CARB should be extremely proud of the people here and vice versa. CARB should be very pleased with the work that they're doing. How many times people cited the work of CARB as setting some of the standards. Uh, Lee Kun Sheng looking at Beijing as the California of, of China. And Amita looking at Delhi as the California of India, although a little bit more challenging in that case. And also to come to this wonderful facility, which is now commensurate with the work that you're doing uh, to set the, uh, the global lead on that. So I'd also agree with, and I'll come back to Professor Kittleson. I remember when my uh, last few years at ARB, fine particles were coming up in process then, of course, partially pushed by Axel Friedrich and Michael and the staff were saying, well, no, we can't, you can't set regulations for that you can't measure. Well, now 20 years later, I don't see with a facility like this, and you've got people like CSERT and Matt and colleagues up there, how you can say you can't measure it. Madam Chair, don't take no for an answer. Thank you very much indeed, and thanks, staff. I should say, but let me add one more, what I would like to read, because uh, I highly respect the, the staff at CARB, as well as the board, but, but this is from the staff. And these are comments from uh, Jörn Herner, from both Michael and Arthur as retire. So he says, he re re writes, Dear Michael and Arthur, thank you so very much for serving on the advisory committee for all these years. It's been a true pleasure and honor to work with you. Not only do you have the excellent judgment when it comes to possible Hagen Schmidt Award winners, but you're also superstars of your, in your field of your own right. I was always impressed and appreciative of how kind and gracious you were with our staff working on Hagen Schmidt, making the program a very pleasant assignment. So thank you very much, Ewan. And thank you and congratulate again to all the members here and thank the staff for the wonderful job they do helping the committee to sort out uh, all the incoming recommendations. I should also say, and I don't think I did it, I didn't stress enough, Michael was instrumental in making sure that the Hagen Schmidt awards were basically expanded 
for international recognition. And you can see it's not been easy, but staff has also done a great job in extending that reach. It's been more difficult by COVID, as, as, we, as we've seen there, but I think uh, now uh, it's very important as we see some of these countries really developing those regulations. And one of the things that the nomination committee have to look at is how do you weight some of these uh, people in these developing countries, weigh those against people who have been very active for the years here. But um, that's a nice challenge to have. So thank you, back to you. Thank you for all those kind words. Um, and with that, I will conclude our talks for this year. I want to, again, congratulate all of our winners. I want to thank all of the advisory committee members current and retiring and that will be in the future, but uh, congratulations.